Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. We are on chapter 13. Marvin trudged on down the corridor, still moaning. And then, of course, I've got this terrible pain in all the diodes down my left-hand side. No, said Arthur grimly as he walked along beside him. Really? Oh, yes, said Marvin. I mean, I've asked for them to be replaced, but no one ever listens. I can't imagine. Vague whistling and humming noises were coming from Ford. Well, 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 he kept saying to himself. They fod Beeblebrocks. Suddenly, Marvin stopped and held up a hand. You know what's happened now, of course. No, what, said Arthur, who didn't want to know. We've arrived at another of those doors. There was a sliding door let into the side of the corridor. Marvin eyed it suspiciously. Well, said Ford impatiently, do we go through? Do we go through, mimicked Marvin. Yes, this is the entrance to the bridge. I was told to take you to the bridge. Probably the highest demand that will be made on my intellectual capacities today, I shouldn't wonder. Slowly, with a great loathing, he stepped toward the door like a hunter stalking his prey. Suddenly, it slid open. Thank you, it said, for making a simple door very happy. Deep in Marvin's thorax, gears ground. Funny, he intoned funereally. How just when you think life can't possibly get any worse, it suddenly does. He heaved himself through the door and, let Ford and, Arth and left Ford and Arthur staring at each other and shrugging their shoulders. From inside, they heard Marvin's voice again. I suppose you'll want to see the aliens now, he said. Do you want me to sit in a corner and rust or just fall apart where I'm standing? Yeah, just show them in, would you, Marvin, came another voice. Arthur looked at Ford and was astonished to see him laughing. What's... Shh, said Ford. Come on in. He stepped through into the bridge. Arthur followed him in nervously and was astonished to see a man lolling back in a chair with his feet on a control console, picking the teeth in his right-hand head with his left hand. The right-hand head seemed to be thoroughly preoccupied with this task, but the left one was grinning with a broad, relaxed, nonchalant grin. The number of things that Arthur couldn't believe he was seeing was fairly large. His jaw flopped, flopped about at a loose end for a while. Hi, Duo. Welcome back. How are you today? The peculiar man waved a lazy wave at Ford and, with an appalling affection, affectation of nonchalance, said, Ford, hi. How are you? Glad you could drop in. Ford was not going to be outcooled. Zaphod, he drawled. Great to see you. You're looking well. The extra arm suits you. Nice ship you've stolen. Arthur goggled at him. You mean you know this guy? He said, waving a wild finger at Zaphod. Know him? exclaimed Ford. He's... He paused and decided to do the introductions the other way around. Oh, Zaphod, this is a friend of mine, Arthur Dent, he said. I saved him when his planet blew up. Oh, sure, said Zaphod. Hi, Arthur. Glad you could make it. His right-hand head looked round casually, said hi, and went back to having its teeth picked. Ford carried on. And Arthur, he said, this is my semi-cousin, Zaphod Beep. Oh, we've met, said Arthur sharply. When you're cruising down the road in the fast lane and you lazily sail past a few hard-driving cars and are feeling pretty pleased with yourself and then accidentally change down from fourth to first instead of third, thus making your engine leap out of your hood in a rather ugly mess, it tends to throw you off your stride in much the same way that this remark threw Ford Prefect off his. Oh, what? He said. I said, we've met. 
Zaphod gave an awkward start of surprise and jabbed a gum sharply. Hey, uh, have have we? Hey, um. Mm. Ford rounded on Arthur with an angry flash in his eyes. Now he felt he was back on home ground. He suddenly began to resent having lumbered himself with this ignorant primitive who knew as much about the affairs of the galaxy as an Ilford-based gnat knew about life in Peking. What do you mean you've met? he demanded. This is Zaphod Beeblebrox from Beetlejuice 5. You know, not bloody Martin Smith from Croydon. I don't care, said Arthur coldly. We've met, haven't we, Zaphod Beeblebrox? Or should I, should I say, Bill? What? shouted Ford. You'll have to remind me, said Zaphod. I have a terrible memory for species. I was at a party, pursued Arthur. Yeah, well, I doubt that, said Zaphod. Cool it, will you, Arthur? demanded Ford. Arthur would not be deterred. A party six months ago, on Earth, England. Zaphod shook his head with a tight-lipped smile. London, insisted Arthur. Islington. Oh, said Zaphod, with a guilty start. That party... This wasn't fair on Ford at all. He looked backward and forward between Arthur and Zaphod. What? he said to Zaphod. You don't mean to say you've been on that miserable little planet as well, do you? No, of course not, said Zaphod breezily. Well, I, I may have just dropped in briefly, you know, on my way somewhere. But I was stuck there for fifteen years? Well, I didn't know that, did I? But what were you doing there? Looking about, you know. He gatecrashed a party, said Arthur, trembling with anger. A fancy dress party. It would have to be, wouldn't it, said Ford. At this party, persisted Arthur, was a girl. Oh, well, look, it doesn't matter now. The whole place has gone up in smoke anyway. I wish you'd stop sulking about that bloody planet, said Ford. Who was the lady? Oh, just somebody. Well, all right. I wasn't doing very well with her. I'd been trying all evening. Hell, she was something, though. Beautiful, charming, devastatingly intelligent. At last, I got her to myself for a bit and was plying her with a bit of a talk when this friend of yours barges up and says, Hey, doll, is this guy boring you? Why don't you talk to me instead? I'm from a different planet. I never saw her again. Zephod exclaimed Ford. Yes, said Arthur, glaring at him and trying not to feel foolish. He only had the two arms and the one head, and he called himself Phil. But, but you must admit, he did turn out to be from another planet, said Trillian, walking into sight at the other end of the bridge. She gave Arthur a pleasant smile, which settled on him like a ton of bricks, and then turned her attention to the ship's controls again. There was silence for a few seconds, and then, out of the scrambled mess of Arthur's brain, crawled some words. "'Trisha McMillan?' he said. "'What are you doing here?' "'Same as you,' she said. "'I hitched a lift. After all, with a degree in math and another in astrophysics, what else was there to do? It was either that or the dole cue again on Monday.' "'Infinity minus one,' chattered the computer." Improbability sum now complete. Zaphod looked about him as at Ford, at Arthur, and then at Trillian. Trillian, he said, is this sort of thing going to happen every time we use the improbability drive? Very probably, I'm afraid, she said. I see my son is here. Hello, Krim. Are you critiquing my wardrobe? If we get thirsty trolls, kick them to the curb. And Nibbler is a VIP. Um, so the roles work, the new roles, and I've, I've only just begun fiddling with them. 
Um, you can't be a mod and have the VIP status. So I tried to give you the, the VIP, but it will not allow me to do so. Yes, that little diamond next to your name. Oh, pardon me. That little diamond next to your name means you're a VIP. And I forget what it says, like what all it says you can do. Nope, you, you just assign it. I assign it to people. Yeah, that is kind of lame that you can't um, do that for your mods because I feel like mods should be VIP as well. But yeah, you can only have 10 of them in your channel. Um, as far as I know, maybe it's different if you're a partner. You can have 10 VIPs, so I picked uh, who aren't mods. So, so far I have Nibbler, Womps, and Elden. Alrighty. <clears throat> She'll donate more. That's not necessary. But you are here like every single stream. You're a very uh, reliable viewer. And you've been here since almost the beginning, so. <clears throat> Alright, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Chapter 14. The Heart of Gold fled on silently through the night of space, now on conventional photon drive. Its crew of four were ill at ease knowing that they had been brought together, not of their own volition or simple coincidence, but by some curious perversion of physics, as if relationships between people were susceptible to the same laws that govern the relationships between atoms and molecules. As the ship's artificial night closed in, they were each grateful to retire to separate cabins and try to rationalize their thoughts. Trillian couldn't sleep. She sat on a couch and stared at a small cage which contained her last and only links with Earth, two white mice that she had insisted Zaphod let her bring. She had expected never to see the planet again, but she was disturbed by her negative reaction to the news of the planet's destruction. It seemed remote and unreal, and she could find no thoughts to think about it. She watched the mice scurrying round the cage and running furiously in their little plastic tread wheels till they occupied her whole attention. Suddenly, she shook herself and went back onto the bridge to watch over the tiny flashing lights and figures that charted the ship's progress through the void. She wished, wished she knew what it was that she was trying not to think about. Zaphod couldn't sleep. He also wished he knew what it was that he wouldn't let himself think about. For as long as he could remember, he'd suffered from a vague, nagging feeling of not being all there. Most of the time, he was able to put this thought aside and not worry about it, but it had been reawakened by the sudden, inexplicable arrival of Ford Prefect and Arthur Dent. Somehow, it seemed to conform to a pattern that he couldn't see. Ford couldn't sleep. He was too excited about being back on the road again. Fifteen years of virtual imprisonment were over just as he was finally beginning to give up hope. Knocking about with Zaphod for a bit promised to be a lot of fun, though there seemed to be something faintly odd about his semi-cousin that he couldn't put his finger on. The fact that he had become president of the galaxy was frankly astonishing, as was the manner of his leaving the post. Was there a reason behind it? There would be no point in asking Zaphod. He never appeared to have a reason for anything he did at all. He had turned unfathomability into an art form. He attacked everything in life with a mixture of extraordinary genius and naive incompetence, and it was often difficult to tell which was which. Arthur slept. He was terribly tired. There was a tap at Zaphod's door. It slid open. Zaphod? Yeah? Trillian stood outlined in the oval of light. I think we just found what you came to look for. Hey, yeah? Ford gave up the attempt to sleep. In the corner of his cabin was a small computer screen and keyboard. He sat at it for a while and tried to compose a new entry for the guide on the subject of Vogons, but couldn't think of anything vitriolic enough, so he gave up on that too, wrapped a robe round himself, and went for a walk to the bridge. As he entered, he was surprised to see two figures hunched excitedly over the instruments. See? The ship's about to move into orbit, Trillian was saying. There's a planet out there. It's at the exact coordinates you predicted. 
Zaphod heard a noise and looked up. Ford, he hissed. Hey, come take a look at this. Ford went and had a look at it. It was a series of figures flickering over a screen. You recognize those galactic coordinates? said Zaphod. No. I'll give you a clue. Computer! Hi, gang! enthused the computer. This is getting real sociable, isn't it? Shut up, said Zaphod, and show us the screens. Light on the bridge sank. Pinpoints of light played across the consoles and reflected in four pairs of eyes that stared up at the external monitor screens. There was absolutely nothing on them. Recognize that? whispered Zaphod. Ford frowned. Uh, no, he said. What do you see? Nothing. Recognize it? What are you talking about? We're in the Horsehead Nebula. One whole vast dark cloud. And I was meant to recognize that from a blank screen. Inside a dark nebula is the only place in the galaxy you'd see a dark screen. Very good. Zaphod laughed. He was clearly very excited about something, almost childishly so. Hey, this is really terrific. This is just far too much. What's so great about being stuck in a dust cloud, said Ford. What would you reckon to find here, urged Zaphod. Nothing. No stars, no planets. No. Computer, shouted Zaphod. Rotate angle of vision through 180 degrees and don't talk about it. For a moment, it seemed that nothing was happening. Then a brightness glowed at the edge of the huge screen. A red star, the size of a small plate, crept across it, followed quickly by another one. A binary system. Then a vast crescent sliced into the corner of the picture, a red glare shading away into deep black, the night side of the planet. We found it! cried Zaphod, thumping the console. I found it! Ford stared at it in astonishment. What is it? he said. That, said Zaphod, is the most improbable planet that ever existed. I see authors here. Hello, my dear. How you feeling today? Yeah, and mods have like full privileges, so I see what you mean. I do the same thing. Um, I know, like, Ford was a little off in the movie. He wasn't quite right. Um, like, as far as he's described in the book, because he's described as a ginger in the book, and I think he's supposed to be, not English, but sound like an Englishman. And in the movie, he's a, an American black man. Um, but I do, I still see him, and when he's described in the book, it actually throws me off a little bit. Um, but yeah, I definitely see Sam Rockwell as Zaphod Beeblebrox. I feel like you could not have cast that better, to be honest. Well, I'm glad that you're here for a little while. That's good. It's good to get out and do a couple of little things. <clears throat> Chapter 15, which is rather short. Excerpt from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Page 634,784, Section 5A. Entry, Magrathea. Far back in the mists of an ancient time, in the great and glorious days of the former galactic empire, life was wild, rich, and largely tax-free. Mighty starships plied their way between exotic suns, seeking adventure and reward among the farthest reaches of galactic space. In those days, spirits were brave, the stakes were high, men were real men, women were real women, and small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri were real small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri. And all dared to brave unknown terrors to do mighty deeds, to boldly split infinity 
alternatives that no man had split before, and thus was the empire forged. Many men, of course, became extremely rich, but this was perfectly natural and nothing to be ashamed of because no one was really poor, at least no one worth speaking of. And for all the richest and most successful merchants, life inevitably, inevitably became rather dull and niggly, and they began to imagine that this was therefore the fault of the worlds they'd settled on. None of them was entirely satisfactory. Either the climate wasn't quite right in the later part of the afternoon, or the day was half an hour too long, or the sea was exactly the wrong shade of pink. And thus were created the conditions for a staggering new form of specialist industry, custom-made luxury planet building. The home of this industry was the planet Magrathea, where hyperspatial engineers sucked matter through white holes in space to form it into dream planets. Gold planets, platinum planets, soft rubber planets with lots of earthquakes, all lovingly made to meet the exact standards that the galaxy's richest men naturally came to expect. But so successful was this venture that Magrathea itself soon became the richest planet of all time and the rest of the galaxy was reduced to abject poverty. And so the system broke down, the empire collapsed, and a long sullen silence settled over a billion hungry worlds, disturbed only by the pen scratchings of scholars as they labored into the night over smug little treatises, treatises on the value of planned political economy. Magrathea itself disappeared and its memory soon passed into the obscurity of legend. In these enlightened days, of course, no one believes a word of it. Chapter 18 Arthur awoke to the sound of argument and went to the bridge. Ford was waving his arms about. You're crazy, Zaphod! he was saying. Magrathea is a myth, a fairy story. It's what parents tell their kids about at night if they want them to grow up to become economists. It's, and that's, what we are currently in orbit about, insisted Zaphod. Look, I can't help what you may personally be in orbit about, said Ford, but this ship... Computer! shouted Zaphod. Oh no. Hi there! This is Eddie, your shipboard computer, and I'm feeling just great, guys, and I know I'm just going to get a bundle of kicks out of any program you care to run through me. Arthur looked inquiringly at Trillian. She motioned him to come on in, but keep quiet. Computer, said Zaphod, tell us what our present trajectory is. A real pleasure, feller. It burbled. We are currently in orbit at an altitude of 300 miles around the legendary planet of Magrathea. Proving nothing, said Ford. I wouldn't trust that computer to speak my weight. I can do that for you, sure, enthused the computer, punching out more ticker tape. I can even work out your personality problems to ten decimal places if it will help. Trillian interrupted. Zaphod, she said. Any minute now, we will be swinging round to the daylight side of this planet, adding whatever it turns out to be. Hey, what do you mean by that? The planet's where I predicted it would be, isn't it? Yes, I know there's a planet there. I'm not arguing with anyone. It's just that I wouldn't know Magrathea from any other lump of cold rock. Dawn's coming up if you want it. Okay, okay, muttered Zaphod. Let's at least give our eyes a good time. Computer! Hi there. What can I just shut up and give us a view of the planet again? A dark featureless mass once more filled the screens, the planet rolling away beneath them. They watched for a moment in silence, but Zaphod was fidgety with excitement. We're now traversing the night side, he said in a hushed voice. The planet rolled on. <clears throat> The surface of the planet's now 300 miles beneath us, he continued. He was trying to restore a sense of occasion to what he felt should have been a great moment. Magrathea. He was piqued by Ford's skeptical reaction. Magrathea. In a few moments, he continued, we should see... There. The moment carried itself. Even the most seasoned... Star Tramp can't help but shiver at the spectacular drama of a sunrise seen from space. But a binary sunrise is one of the marvels of the galaxy. <clears throat> Out of the utter blackness stabbed a sudden point of blinding light. 
It crept up by slight degrees and spread sideways in a thin, thin crescent blade, and within seconds two suns were visible, furnaces of light searing the black edge of the horizon with white fire. Fierce shafts of color streaked through the thin atmosphere beneath them. The fires of dawn, breathed Zaphod, the twin suns of the Solianus and Rom. Or whatever, said Ford quietly. Solianus and Rom, insisted Zaphod. The suns blazed into the pitch of space and a low ghostly music floated through the bridge. Marvin was humming ironically because he hated humans so much. As Ford gazed at the spectacle of light before them, excitement burned inside him, but only the excitement of seeing a strange new planet. It was enough for him to see it as it was. <clears throat> it faintly irritated him that Zaphod had to impose some ludicrous fantasy onto the scene to make it work for him. All this Magrathea nonsense seemed juvenile. Isn't it enough to see that a garden is beautiful without having to believe that there are fairies at the bottom of it, too? All this Magrathea business seemed totally incomprehensible to Arthur. He edged up to Trillian and asked her what was going on. I only know what Zaphod's told me, she whispered. Apparently, Magrathea is some kind of legend from way back when no one seriously believes in. Oh, from way back, which no one seriously believes in. Bit like Atlantis on Earth, except that the legends say the Magratheans used to manufacture planets. Arthur blinked at the screens and felt he was missing something important. Suddenly, he realized what it was. Is there any tea on this spaceship? he asked. More of the planet was unfolding beneath them as the heart of gold streaked along its orbitable, orbital path. <clears throat> the suns now stood high in the black sky, the pyrotechnics of dawn were over, and the surface of the planet appeared bleak and forbidding in the common light of day gray, dusty, and only dimly contoured. It looked dead and cold as a crypt. From time to time, promising features would appear on the distant horizon. Ravines, maybe. Mountains, maybe even cities. But as they approached, the lines would soften and blur into anonymity, and nothing would transpire. The planet's surface was blurred by time, by the slow movement of the thin, stagnant air that had crept across it for century upon century. Clearly, it was very, very old. <clears throat> Hello, Kiara. How are you? Thank you for hosting. <clears throat> A moment of doubt came to Ford as he watched the gray landscape move beneath them. The immensity of time worried him. He could feel it as a presence. He cleared his throat. Well, even supposing it is... It is, said Zaphod. Which it isn't, continued Ford. What do you want with it anyway? There's nothing there. Not on the surface, said Zaphod. All right, just supposing there's something. I take it you're not here for the sheer industrial archaeology of it all. What are you after? <clears throat> One of Zaphod's heads looked away. The other one looked round to see what the first was looking at, but it wasn't looking at anything very much. Well, said Zaphod airily, it's partly the curiosity, partly a sense of adventure, but mostly I think it's the fame and the money. Ford glanced at him sharply. He got a very strong impression that Zaphod hadn't the faintest idea why he was there at all. You know, I don't like the look of that planet at all, said Trillian, shivering. Ah, uh, take no notice, said Zaphod. With half the wealth of the former galactic empire stored on it somewhere, it can afford to look frumpy. Bullshit, thought Ford. Even supposing this was the home of some ancient civilization now gone to dust, even supposing a number of exceedingly unlikely things, there was no way that vast treasures of wealth were going to be stored there in any form that would still have meaning now. He shrugged. I think it's just a dead planet, he said. The suspense is killing me, said Arthur testily. 
Stress and nervous tension are now serious social problems in all parts of the galaxy, and it is in order that this situation should not be in any way exacerbated that the following facts will now be revealed in, in advance. The planet in question is, in fact, the legendary Magrathea. The deadly missile attack shortly to be launched by an ancient automatic defense system will result merely in the breakage of three coffee cups and a mouse cage, the bruising of somebody's upper arm, and the untimely creation and sudden demise of a bowl of petunias and an innocent sperm whale. In order that some sense of mystery should still be preserved, no revelation will yet be made concerning whose upper arm sustains the bruise. This fact may safely be made by the subject of suspense. It is of no significance whatsoever. I'm sorry you've still got headaches, Kiara. Boo. <clears throat> My voice is not having any of this today. No siree. Yeah, that would be an annoyance. <clears throat> the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Chapter 17. After a fairly shaky start to the day, Arthur's mind was beginning to reassemble itself from the shell-shocked fragments that the previous day had left him with. He had found a new traumatic machine which had provided him with a plastic cup filled with a liquid that was almost, but not quite, entirely unlike tea. The way it functioned was very interesting. When the drink button was pressed, it made an instant but highly detailed examination of the subject's taste buds, a spectroscopic analysis of the subject's metabolism, and then sent tiny experimental signals down the neural pathways to the taste centers of the subject's brain to see what was likely to go down well. However, no one knew quite why it did this because it invariably variably delivered a cup full of liquid that was almost, but not quite, entirely unlike tea. The new dramatic was designed and manufactured by the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation, whose complaints department now covers all major land masses of the first three planets in the Sirius Tau star system. Arthur drank the liquid and found it reviving. He glanced up at the screens again and watched a few more hundred miles of barren grayness slide past. It suddenly occurred to him to ask a question that had been bothering him. <clears throat> Is it safe? he said. Magrathy has been dead for five million years, said Zaphod. Of course it's safe. Even the ghosts will have settled down and raised families by now. At which point, a strange and inexplicable sound thrilled suddenly through the bridge. A noise as of a distant fanfare. A hollow, reedy, insubstantial sound. It preceded a voice that was equally hollow, reedy, and insubstantial. The voice said, Greetings to you. Someone from the dead planet was talking to them. Computer, shouted Zaphod. Hi there. What the photon is it? Oh, just some five million year old tape that's being broadcast at us. A what? A recording? Shush, said Ford. It's carrying on. The voice was old, courteous, almost charming, but was underscored with quite unmistakable menace. This is a recorded announcement, it said. As I'm afraid we're all out at the moment, the Commercial Council of Magrathea thanks you for your esteemed visit. A voice from ancient Magrathea, thought Zaphod. Okay, okay, said Ford. But regrets, continued the voice, that the entire planet is temporarily closed for business. Thank you. If you would care to leave your name and the address of a planet where you can be contacted, kindly speak when you hear the tone. A short buzz followed the silence. They want to get rid of us, said Trillian nervously. What do we do? It's just a recording, said Zaphod. We keep going. Got that, computer? I got it, said the computer, and gave the ship an extra kick of speed. They waited. After a second or so came the fanfare once again, and then the voice. 
We would like to assure you that as soon as our business is resumed, announcements will be made in all fashionable magazines and color supplements when our clients will once again be able to select from all that's been in contemporary geography. All that's best in contemporary geography. The menace in the voice took on a sharper edge. Meanwhile, we thank our clients for their kind interest and would ask them to leave now. Arthur looked round the nervous faces of his companions. Well, I suppose we'd better be going then, hadn't we? He suggested. Shh, said Zaphod. There's absolutely nothing to be worried about. Then why is everyone so tense? They're just interested, shouted Zaphod. Computers, start descent to the atmosphere and prepare for landing. This time, the fanfare was quite perfunctory, the voice now distinctly cold. It is most gratifying, it said, that your enthusiasm for our planet continues unabated, and so we would like to assure you that the guided missiles currently converging with your ship are part of a special service we extend to all of our most enthusiastic clients, and the fully armed nuclear warheads are, of course, merely a courtesy detail. We look forward to your custom in future lives. Thank you. The voice snapped off. <clears throat> oh, have a good day, Kiara. Good to see you for a second. <clears throat> the voice snapped off. Oh, said Trillian. Uh, said Arthur. Well, said Ford. Look, said Zaphod, will you get it into your heads? That's just a recorded message. It's millions of years old. It doesn't apply to us. Get it? What, said Trillian quietly, about the missiles? Missiles? Don't make me laugh. Ford tapped Zaphod on the shoulder and pointed at the rear screen. Clear in the distance behind them, two silver darts were climbing through the atmosphere toward the ship. A quick change of magnification brought them into close focus. Two massively real rockets thundering through the sky. The suddenness of it was shocking. I think they're going to have a very good try at applying to us, said Ford. Zaphod stared at them in astonishment. Hey, this is terrific, he said. Someone down there is trying to kill us. Terrific, said Arthur. But don't you see what this means? Yes, we're going to die. But apart from that, apart from that, it means we must be onto something. How soon can we get off it? Second by second, the image of the missiles on the screen grew larger. They had swung round now onto a direct homing course so that all, all that could be seen of them now was the warheads head on. As a matter of interest, said Trillian, what are we going to do? Just keep cool, said Zaphod. Is that all? shouted Arthur. No, we're also going to, uh, take evasive action, said Zaphod with a sudden access of panic. Computer, what evasive action can we take? Oh, none, I'm afraid, guys, said the computer. Or something, said Zaphod. There seems to be, oh, sorry, <clears throat> There seems to be something jamming my guidance system, explained the computer brightly. Impact minus 45 seconds. Please call me Eddie if it will help you to relax. Zaphod tried to run in several equally decisive directions simultaneously. Right, he said. Oh, we got to get the manual control of this ship. Get to manual control. Can you fly her? asked Ford pleasantly. Uh, no. Can you? No. Trillian, can you? No. Fine, said Zaphod, relaxing. We'll do it together. I can't either, said Arthur, who felt it was time he began to assert himself. I'd guess that, said Zaphod. Okay, computer, I want full manual control now. You got it, said the computer. Several large desk panels slid open and banks of control consoles sprang up out of them, showering the crew with bits of expanded polystyrene packaging and balls of rolled up cellophane. 
These controls had never been used before. Zaphod stared at them wildly. Okay, Ford, he said. Full retro thrust and ten degrees starboard, or something. Good luck, guys, chirped the computer. Impact minus thirty seconds. Ford leapt to the controls. Only a few of them made any immediate sense to him, so he pulled those. The ship shook and screamed as its guidance rocket jets tried to push it every which way simultaneously. He released half of them, and the ship spun round in a tight arc and headed back the way it had come, straight toward the oncoming missiles. Air cushions ballooned out of the walls in an instant as everyone was thrown against them. For a few seconds, the inertial forces held them flattened and squirming for breath, unable to move. Zaphod struggled and pushed in a manic desperation and finally managed a savage kick at a small lever that formed part of the guidance system. The lever snapped off. The ship twisted sharply and rocketed upward. The crew were hurled violently back against the back across the cabin. Ford's copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy smashed into another section of the control console, with the combined result that the guide started to explain to anyone who cared to listen about the best ways of smuggling Antarian parakeet glands out of Antares. An Antarian parakeet gland stuck on a small stick is a revolting but much sought after cocktail delicacy, and very large sums of money are often paid for them by very rich idiots who want to impress other very rich idiots and the ship suddenly dropped out of the sky like a stone. It was, of course, more or less at this moment that one of the crew sustained a nasty bruise to the upper arm. This should be emphasized because, as has already been revealed, they escape otherwise completely unharmed, and the deadly nuclear missiles do not eventually hit the ship. The safety of the crew is absolutely assured. Impact minus 20 seconds, guys, said the computer. Then turn the bloody engines back on, bawled Zaphod. Oh, sure thing, guys, said the computer. With a subtle roar, the engines cut back in. The ship smoothly flattened out of its dive and headed back toward the missiles again. The computer started to sing. When you walk through the storm, it whined nasally. Hold your head up high. Zaphod screamed at it to shut up, but his voice was lost in the din of what they quite naturally assumed was approaching destruction. Don't be afraid of the dark, Eddie wailed. The ship, in flattening out, had in fact flattened out upside down, and lying on the ceiling as they were, it was now totally impossible for any of the crew to reach the guidance systems. <clears throat> the two missiles loomed massively on the screens as they thundered toward the ship, but by an extraordinarily lucky chance, they had not yet fully corrected their flight paths to that of the erratically weaving ship, and they passed right under it. Revised impact time, 15 seconds, fellas. Walk on through the wind. The missiles banged around in a screeching arc and plunged back in pursuit. This is it said Arthur, watching them. We are now quite definitely going to die, aren't we? I wish you'd stop saying that, shouted Ford. Well, we are, aren't we? Yes. Walk on through the rain, sang Eddie. A thought struck Arthur. He struggled to his feet. Why doesn't anyone turn on that improbability drive thing, he said. We could probably reach that. What are you, crazy? said Zaphod. Without proper programming, anything could happen. Does that matter at this stage? shouted Arthur. Through, though your dreams be tossed and blown, sang Eddie. Arthur scrambled up onto one of the exciting, excitingly chunky pieces of molded contouring where the curve of the wall met the ceiling. Does anyone know why Arthur can't turn on the improbability drive? shouted Trillian. And you'll never walk alone. Impact minus five seconds. It's been great knowing you guys. God bless. I said, yelled Trillian, does anyone know? The next thing that happened was a mind-mangling explosion of noise and light. Well, have a good night, author. Enjoy dinner.
The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Chapter 18. The next thing that happened after that was that the Heart of Gold continued on its way perfectly normally with a rather fetchingly redesigned interior. It was somewhat larger and done out in delicate pastel shades of green and blue. In the center, a spiral staircase, leading nowhere in particular, stood in a spray of ferns and yellow flowers, and next to it a stone sundial pedestal housed the main computer terminal. Cunningly deployed lighting and mirrors created the illusion of standing in a conservatory overlooking a wide stretch of exquisitely manicured garden. Around the periphery of the conservatory area stood marble top tables on an intricately beautiful wrought iron legs. As you gazed into the polished surface of the marble, the vague forms of instruments became visible, and as you touched them, the instruments materialized instantly under your hands. Looked at from the correct angles, the mirrors appeared to reflect all the required data readouts, though it was far from clear what they were reflected from. It was, in fact, sensationally beautiful. Relaxing in a wickerwork sun chair, Zaphod Beeblebrock said, What the hell happened? Well, I was just saying, said Arthur, lounging by a small fish pool, there's this improbability drive switch over here. He waved at it where it had been. There was a potted plant there now. But where are we? said Ford, who was sitting on the spiral staircase, a nicely chilled pangalactic gargle blaster in his hand. Exactly where we were, I think, said Trillian, as all about them the mirror suddenly shone them an image of the blighted landscape of Magrathea, which still scooted along beneath them. Zaphod leapt out of his chair. Then what's happening to the missiles, he said. A new and astounding image appeared in the mirrors. They would appear, said Ford doubtfully, to have turned into a bowl of petunias and a very surprised-looking whale. Add an improbability factor, cut in Eddie, who hadn't changed a bit, of 8,767,128 to 1 against. Zaphod stared at Arthur. Do you think of that, Earthman? He demanded. Well, said Arthur, all I did was, that's very good thinking, you know, turn on the improbability drive for a second without first activating the proofing screens, Hey, kid, you just saved our lives, you know that? Oh, said Arthur. Well, it was nothing, really. Was it? said Zaphod. Oh, well, forget it then. Okay, computer, take us in to land. But I said forget it. Another thing that got forgotten was the fact that against all probability, a sperm whale had suddenly been called into existence several miles above the surface of an alien planet. Since this is not a naturally tenable position for a whale, this poor, innocent creature had very little time to come to terms with its identity as a whale, before it then had to come to terms with not being a whale anymore. This is a complete record of its thought from the moment it began its life till the moment it ended. Ah! What's happening? It thought. Excuse me, who am I? Hello? Why am I here? What's my purpose in life? What do I mean by who am I? Calm down, get a grip now. Oh, this is an interesting sensation. What is it? It's sort of yawning, tingling sensation. And my, well, I suppose I'd better start finding names for things if I want to make any headway. In what for the sake of what I shall call an argument. I shall call the world, so uh, let's call it my stomach. Good. Oh, it's getting quite strong and... Hey, what's, what about this whistling, roaring sound going past what I'm suddenly going to call my head? Perhaps I call that wind. Is that a good name? It'll do. I'll perhaps... Perhaps I can find a better name for it later when I've found out what it's for. It must be something very important because there certainly seems to be a hell of a lot of it. Hey, what's this thing? This? Let's call it a tail. Yeah, tail. Hey, I can really thrash it about pretty good, can't I? Wow. Wow. That feels great. Doesn't seem to achieve very, very much, but I'll probably find out what it's for later on. Now, have I built up any coherent picture of things yet? No, never mind. Hey, this is really quite exciting. So much to find out about, so much to look forward to. I'm quite dizzy with anticipation. Or is it the wind? There really is a lot of that now, isn't there? 
And wow, hey, what's this thing suddenly coming toward me very fast? Very, very fast. So big and flat and round, it needs a big, wide-sounding name like Ow, Ound, Round, Ground. That's it. That's a good name, Ground. I wonder if it will be friends with me. And the rest, after a sudden wet thud, was silence. Curiously enough, the only thing that went through the mind of the bowl of petunias as it fell was, oh no, not again. Many people have speculated that if we knew exactly why, why the bowl of petunias had thought that, we would know a lot more about the nature of the universe than we do now. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Chapter 19 Are we taking this robot with us? said Ford, looking with distaste at Marvin, who was standing in an awkward hunched posture in the corner under a small palm tree. Zaphod glanced away from the mirror screens, which presented a panoramic view of the blighted landscape on which the Heart of Gold had now landed. Oh, the paranoid android, he said. Yeah, we'll take him. But what are you supposed to do with a manically depressed robot? You think you've got problems, said Marvin, as if he was addressing a newly occupied coffin. What are you supposed to do if you are a manically depressed robot? No, don't bother to answer that. I'm 50,000 times more intelligent than you, and even I don't know the answer. It gives me a headache just trying to think down to your level. Trillian burst in through the door of her cabin. My white mice have escaped! White mice. My white mice have escaped, she said. An expression of deep worry and concern failed to cross either of Zephod's faces. Nuts to your white mice, he said. Trillian glared an upset glare at him and disappeared again. It is possible that her remark would have commanded greater attention had it been generally realized that human beings were only the third most intelligent life form present on the planet Earth, instead of, as was generally thought by most independent observers, the second. Good afternoon, boys. The voice was oddly familiar, but oddly different. It had a matriarchal twang. It announced itself to the crew as they arrived at the airlock hatchway that would let them out on the planet's surface. <clears throat> they looked at each other in puzzlement. It's a computer, said Zaphod. I discovered it had an emergency backup personality that I thought might work out better. Now, this is going to be your first day out on a strange new planet continued Eddie's new voice, so I want you all wrapped up, snug and warm, and no playing with any naughty, bug-eyed monsters. Zaphod tapped impatiently on the hatch. I'm sorry, he said. I think we might be better off with a slide rule. Right, snapped the computer. Who said that? Will you open up the exit hatch, please, computer, said Zaphod, trying not to get angry. Not until whoever said that owns up, urged the computer, stamping a few synapses closed. Oh, God, muttered Ford, slumped against a bulkhead. He started to count to ten. He was desperately worried that one day sentient life forms would forget how to do this. Only by counting could humans demonstrate their independence of computers. Come on, said Eddie sternly. Computer, began Zaphod. I'm waiting, interrupted Eddie. I can wait all day if necessary. Computer, said Zaphod again, who had been trying to think of some subtle piece of reasoning to put the computer down with and had decided not to bother competing with it on its own ground. If you don't open that exit hatch at this moment, I shall zap straight off to your major data banks and reprogram you with a very large axe. Got that? Eddie, shocked, paused and considered this. Ford carried on counting quietly. This is about the most aggressive thing you can do to a computer, the equivalent of going up to a human being and saying, blood, blood, blood. Finally, Eddie said quietly, I can see this relationship is something we're all going to have to work at. And the hatchway opened. An icy wind ripped into them. They hugged themselves warmly and stepped down the ramp onto the barren dust of Magrathea. It'll all end in tears, I know it, 
shouted Eddie after them and closed the hatchway again. A few minutes later, he opened and closed the hatchway again in response to a command that caught him entirely by surprise. <clears throat> All right, y'all. I think my voice is done for the day. Like I said, slowly working back up to it, but we've got through uh, chapters 13 through 19 today. And then uh, tomorrow, same bat time, same bat place, we'll start at chapter 20. Uh, try to go a little bit further. It looks like we're going to meet some pretty interesting characters um, in the near future. Let's see how much we have left of Hitchhiker's Guide, actually. Because we are, I think there's like 32 chapters or something. Yeah. 35. So we're almost done. We've got about this much left of Hitchhiker's Guide. So you guys have a good day. Thank you so much for coming and for listening. Um, looks like it's just uh, some folks that we already know, but if you're wanting to join the Discord, so many, so many chapters. Well, what's funny is it's 35 chapters, which seems like a lot, but they're very, very short. Many of the chapters are like one to three pages. Oh, thanks, Nibbler. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But yeah, I'll be back. Um, you guys have a great afternoon. And oh, I was going to address the Jackbox thing. I'm not going to be able to do Jackbox today. Um, I had some stuff come up. But I'm really glad you guys have enjoyed this. Um, you guys have a great day. And I will be back tomorrow. And maybe after the reading stream tomorrow, we'll do some Jackbox if anyone's up to it. But yeah, I'll see you around. Be good to each other. <laughs>